here. Um, I'd like to um, give a special thanks um, for the people that are sponsoring tonight's meeting, and that is Look What I Found and Luna's Mandela. They have a table set up back here. You know, they are a couple of my favorite gift and clothing shops and um, anywhere. And they're right in Conifer, so we are pretty lucky. Um, be sure and go back and, and kind of see what they have. And, um, you know, definitely go by their shop or their website and all of that. Um, they're wonderful. Thank you guys for, for sponsoring tonight. I'd also like to um, issue a special thanks to Sharon Trill. She's with My Mountain Town. Um, not only does she video all of the town hall meetings, um, she has those on her website. Um, she has done a lot for us. She's helped us with trails, um, with, with YouTube videos. Um, you can go to her site and find out all that is going on around the community. So it's, it's great. So um, thank you, Sharon. And thank you, everybody back in the back there. Um, for those of you who have not been to a town hall meeting before, <laughs> i um, just like to talk a little bit about Conifer Area Council. We are a non-political organization. We do not support or oppose any development, issue, political agenda, individual person, or business. And we've asked all of our speakers to include these values in their presentations and to be nonpartisan, non-controversial, and to present just the facts. So there will be no questions or comments during any presentation tonight, but you can ask all the questions you want to or, you know, um, make any comments you'd like to to the speakers during our open house. And that will start just right about 8 o'clock, okay? So, what's going on around here? First of all, we have, um, we have some fantastic schools in the Conifer area. And Principal Ryan Lucas is going to brag just a little bit about Elk Creek Elementary School. Ryan. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Glad I could be here with you this evening. Um, my name is Ryan Lucas. I'm the principal at Elk Creek Elementary School, and we have some outstanding schools up here. Uh, there is a healthy competition between principals at, our, at, the, at the elementary schools. Wendy Woodland was on my hiring committee uh, for a couple years. This is my second year. And so there's some healthy competition with West Jeff Elementary and Marshdale. We all will push, push each other, but we're also very collaborative. Um, there, you can't go wrong with the schools up in, the, up in Conifer. You can't go wrong. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Elk Creek. This is the 25th year for Elk Creek. It was opened in 1989, and uh, it's been doing great things. I'm the fifth principal of the school. And as I said, this is my second year. Uh, Elk Creek is currently ranked um, at the top 6% of all schools in the state of Colorado. We're ranked 60th out of more than 1,000 schools, 1,009 schools to be exact. Um, so we're pretty, pr we're pretty proud of that. Um, we recently, just in terms of uh, Jeffco School News, uh, we are now apparently looking for a new superintendent. I don't know if you heard. <laughs> uh, that's real exciting. Like most, CEO, like most companies, when there's a change in a board, uh, the CEO offers her resignation, his or her resignation, and that's pretty typical if you've been part of a board or a large corporation like that before. Uh, one thing that I can speak for all the principals up here at all levels is that uh, we're just mostly focused on the kids in our school. Kids and teachers, that's what we're hired to do. There is no accident that we, and me specifically, I mean the school is far away from the Ed Center and the politicalness down there as possible because uh, I just care about the kids in my school that are five years old to 11 years old. That's what I'm here for. That's what I'm hired to do. And that's what our teachers are doing. So um, we're real excited uh, for what, what's coming forward. We, it's that period in, in Jeffco schools where there's that unrest and turmoil and you never know what's going to happen. Uh, but one thing that uh, I'm committed to, and I think I speak for the other principals too, is that whatever issues are going on uh, between adults, they absolutely 100% will not and cannot transfer into the classroom. Uh, our job is far too important. Um, the, currently, uh, there are 18 kids at my school between kindergarten and third grade who are not reading at grade level. That's what I should be focused on, and that's what I'm focused on. And that's what those kids' teachers are focused on, is bringing those kids up in reading. Of course, reading gets a lot of the focus, but we also have a high emphasis in math and writing. Uh, you'll start to see we're entering the, the state testing season, so that's coming up. Uh, kindergart or, uh, kindergartners, <laughs> let's try that again. Third graders uh, take 
uh, the TCAP, that's the state assessment, next week on Wednesday and Thursday. And then the first, uh, out of the first 10 days of March, nine of those days, we have testing from third through 10th grade. And then uh, currently there's now um, a new state assessment for science in fifth grade, and that's that'll take place in April. And then uh, fourth graders will take a new social studies assessment in April, and that's called uh, CMAS, C-M-A-S. So that's uh, kind of what's going on in Elk Creek. We're pretty excited. That's what's kind of going on in the district, which is okay. It happens down there. And we stay focused on kids in all of our schools up here. And I just can't emphasize enough, uh, we have some great schools in Conifer. We're real proud to be part of this community. So thank you, and I'll be around for if you have any questions afterward. Thanks, Ryan. And now we have a bunch of updates, okay? Um, first of all is going to be CDOT, and we have Steve Harrelson here. He is the resident engineer um, for CDOT. He's, um, he said not a whole lot's going on, but um, he's going to at least give you a little update. Steve. Thank you. Um, as Shirley said, not a whole lot going on. Uh, the big project we completed last summer, or it's 95% complete, there's passing lanes through South Park. Um, we put two passing lanes between um, Kenosha Pass and Red Hill Pass over by Fair Play, as well as we did some intersection improvements um, at Elkhorn Road, which is the entrance to Indian Mountain. So uh, that was paid for with uh, uh, faster safety money, um, which is the funds that uh, are garnered from your vehicle registration, that the, the surtax that uh, um, hit that there a few years ago. So that's some uh, benefit to the corridor with that project. Um, coming up this summer, we have a small uh, faster safety project uh, right in between, excuse me, uh, not enough water today. Um, between Turkey Creek Canyon and Pine Junction, we're going to replace some of the concrete panels that are about 20, 25 years old, and, then, and they've uh, become speed bumps. We developed a technique where we can rip, that pan rip a panel out um, and replace it using some high early strength concrete and do the whole process in um, the 18 hours between rush hours. So we would start the work um, for instance, going uh, northbound towards Denver at you know, 10 o'clock in the morning when rush hour is over, we would rip out the old concrete, install the new concrete, and have the concrete ready, cured and ready for traffic by uh, 5 a.m. the next day. So uh, we've got that process. We did it one time um, there just above Windy Point uh, a year or so ago. We're going to do that, I think, in four other locations. Also with that same project, we're going to extend the median at Schaefer's Crossing to address the, the crossovers coming down the hill. We're also going to install some radar signs that um, will indicate people's speed because the, the big problem on that hill is it's uh, designed for 50 miles an hour, but uh, over half the traffic is going 70 down that hill. So we're trying to slow people down and uh, keep them on the right side of the road. Um, other than that, uh, the, the big Activity at CDOT this winter has been flood repair. Um, we've done a little bit on Highway 74, um, and you know that's I, I realize that's not exactly in Confer, but it's in this neighborhood. Um, there are going to be some more permanent repairs on uh, Bear Creek Canyon there, as well as an overlay on the four lane section of. Thank you. On the four lane section of uh, Highway 74 between I-70 and Evergreen. And that's about all I've got going. The, the big project, Pine Junction, that we've been designing for several years has still not been funded for construction, so um, I don't know when that will get scheduled. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. That's all I have. Um, one other thing, I, normally I stay here for the open house. I have some personal commitments. I can only stay here till about uh, 20 till 8. So if you need to ask me a question or give me a comment, just grab me. Um, and I can help you. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. We might have been a little late with that water, but that was good. Thanks, Angela. Cool. Okay. Um, next, we have um, Director Bruce Staley with RTD to give a little bit of an update. Bruce.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Bruce Daly, I'm an RTD board director. They gave me this cool hat to remind me. It says RTD board director, so I must be it. I, I do hope you, those who, of you who ride the Conifer regional bus are enjoying your new parking ride. Uh, it's uh, not heard any complaints yet, so I hope you uh, are enjoying that. Uh, what I want to do tonight is just give you a quick update on, on our Fast Tracks program. It's an awful lot going on with our commuter and our light rail systems. Uh, the, the, the latest event will be the opening of the Denver Union Station. This is the underground bus station and the above ground commuter rail tracks. Uh, we. Uh, the first event will be the Amtrak will move back in to where it used to uh, park, right in front of the station. That will happen on February the 18th, and then we'll have a grand opening of the Denver Union Station uh, underground bus station on, on Friday, May 9th, and it will be open to the public on the 11th. That's where all the regional and express buses and local buses that uh, currently go into the Market Street bus station. Well now, that will be closed and they will be shifted to the underground bus station at Denver Union Station. This is a much larger bus station. It's three football fields long. It has 22 bays for the buses, including the more articulated buses. And in conjunction with that, because of the high demand on the mall shuttle, Britain the Mall Shuttle, a very popular service that terminates down at the Denver Union Station, the light rail station, with the extra uh, passenger load coming from the new underground bus station, we're going to initiate another free shuttle. It's called the Metro Ride, and it not, won't be quite like the 16th Street Mall Shuttle, which stops on every block, as you probably all know. This shuttle will go uh, will use 18th and 19th streets and will only stop about three or four times. It's free, it'll have two doors to get on and off, it'll get to the other end of the city, the Civic Center Station, much quicker than the Mall Shuttle and it will take some of the pressure off the Mall Shuttle as far as passengers are concerned. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, everyone I know asked me about when is the line to the airport going to be open. Everyone's really interested in writing to the DIA on our commuter rail. Uh, that won't be open until 2016, but they're making great progress. And if you ever have uh, taken a flight recently, you can see the tracks, you can see the bridges. Uh, right now, they're running the catenary lines, the electric power lines. Uh, we have over 50 uh, commuter cars are being assembled. About half of them are being assembled, final assembly in Philadelphia. And the other half are being, the shells are being manufactured by Hyundai Rotem in Korea. And very shortly we'll have a demonstration uh, finished complete so that we can all see it running up and down those tracks. Um, Uh, the, the next, um, well, we've got so much going on. Uh, we're going to, we've just awarded a contract to build the North Park commuter rail. Uh, to, that will run up to 124th from Denver Union Station. That won't be finished until 2018. So, Coming out of Denver Union Station, you will have the current West Corridor Line, which is above ground uh, light rail, and then in the station itself will be the commuter rail to the east, to the airport, and another line to the northwest, and an electrified line to the northwest, and then a line up in Toronto, in Golden, commuter rail, which will all be finished in 2016. And I have been given the deadly time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. We have so many speakers, so many things to talk about. We just don't have enough time. Um, okay, next we have President Melissa Baker. Um, she's president of the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce. Melissa. 
Thank you, Shirley. I'm going to try and be quick. I know we're short on time. Uh, we have a lot of things that are, thank you, Angela. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of things going on at the chamber right now. For those of you who don't know, our executive director, Dawn Smith, has left us for the Golden Chamber. She's now the president and CEO. If you know someone who's interested in our executive director position, we are accepting resumes now through next Wednesday. Um, this is a great position, and we are looking for really energetic and exciting people to fulfill it. Um, the other thing that's really exciting about our staffing is that we are moving from one paid staff to one and a half staff members, and we have just hired our admin position who's going to come in and fill us in for kind of the interim and then continue on as our part-time admin person, and this is Sean Porter. She's been working in our community for the past year or so. She's super energetic, and we're really excited about her. Um, also coming up, we are in our planning session right now, and we are working through some exciting educational opportunities for this year. One of the things that we're looking at is a new education series on how to start your business. For those of you who have contemplated or thought about starting your own business here in Conifer, um, come see me. and Make sure you get on our email list because we're looking at opportunities on how to write your business plan, um, learning about different financial opportunities. Um, this is going to be a really, really exciting uh, new education series. Also coming up, we have our annual awards. Um, if you know a business in Conifer that you would really like to nominate for uh, business of the year or home-based business of the year, um, please come see me. We have nomination forms back at the desk. We also have nonprofit of the year and our Norman F. Meyer Award for um, community service. So we're really looking for a lot of feedback from the community and um, I'd really appreciate if you could come fill out a nomination form. Um, this award ceremony will be in conjunction with Leadership Evergreen and the Evergreen Chamber. That will be over at the Elks Lodge on March 6th and our sponsor is Superior Home Product Services. Now on to the really fun stuff. I don't know how many of you know, but next Saturday is our second annual Mount Lugo Luge Snow Tubing Competition at Meyer Ranch. This is a really fun opportunity to showcase the fun things to do here in Conifer on our sledding hill. This is, you know, everyone always says, what's our amenity here? Evergreen has a lake, but well, we have a sledding hill. And so we're really, really excited about this event. Um, we've been promoting down the hill, and come on up and play in Conifer. So it's snow tubing open to all ages. It's teams of four that compete. Basically, one person tubes down, the next person tubes down, and when you get all four team members down, the best time wins. This event is sponsored by Doll Plumbing, and it's a fundraiser for both the Chamber and Elk Creek Fire Department, so it's a great way to support your community and have fun at the sledding hill. After our snow tubing competition, the 285 Optimist will host their 285 Barrel stave downhill. If you've ever wanted to learn how to ski on barrel staves, come on out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so after that, you can enjoy, come on over and warm up. And those three Garcias will have our beer tasting later that evening, also featuring tequila. Um, we want to also thank our sponsors for that event, and that's marketing type guys. So we have a lot of things that are coming up. Um, Really, really soon here on Friday, we have our membership meeting. This is open to all members of the community, and we will be featuring Commissioner Don Rozier, who will give us an update from Jefferson County. So uh, thank you guys so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And if you want more information, come see me after the meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Next, we have Peter Barkman. He is a Confer Area Council board member talking about development updates. Peter. Thank you, Shirley. I can be quick because things are still pretty slow with uh, uh, applications and planning and zoning. In your handout, uh, we try to keep this up to date uh, as notices come in through planning and zoning. Uh, uh, and when things get passed by either the planning commissioner or the uh, board of county commissioners, we know them as, as such in the handout. So there are a few in there that have been approved and are done and will be off the, the, the update. Uh, a couple things I'll bring to your attention. Uh, I have uh, in here the, the new issues. Actually, this really isn't a new issue. This has been going on for quite some time. It's a mixed use zone district. And uh, we put this together before yesterday's uh, board meeting with the county commissioners. And I just spoke with uh, Commissioner Ty, and he said they did approve it. So that one is done. The other one I'll bring to your attention.
attention is tomorrow night there's a community meeting uh, for a rezoning case for the Journey Church. Uh, <clears throat> and that will be at the Conifer Crossings Building 11825 U.S. Highway 285. So if you're interested in what they are doing with their property, then uh, that will be a good community meeting to go to. Uh, Punky Keeper and Pat Bouchard are our trails chairs. They aren't here, but Punky wanted me to bring to your attention. We started working on the Elevation Celebration um, annual 5K Runners and Walkers uh, uh, event. This will be July 12th, so we want to get people aware of what's going on. This will raise money for both the uh, Lobos Boosters and Conifer Community Trails. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And now we have Ryan Mosby, the Conifer Public Library Supervisor. Ryan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll keep this short. I know we're on a tight schedule. So uh, I'm here to talk about what's happening at the library. So we have a great year planned. First of all, our Lego club is wildly successful. So thanks to all the youngsters who come out for that. Um, we generally have about 15 to 30 kids there, along with parents who also build with the Legos. So uh, we have continued that into 2014, and uh, that will be uh, once a month there. We try and display all their creations as well. Uh, the one thing we would like to uh, increase our attendance on is baby time and story time. We have those Saturday mornings. Uh, I have flyers over at the table here. So if you know anyone who has little ones who like story time, uh, we'd love to have them come out and do activities and songs and crafts as well as uh, read the stories. Uh, and the big thing is uh, each year I tend to add more to our program schedule. So this year is movies. Uh, we are offering movies um, the first through fourth Saturdays. We're kind of mixing them up between family movies and then kind of more of a, an adult movie club with themes. January was Hitchcock, February was Romance. So uh, there are free movies, and we do offer popcorn. So come on out. It's just a fun thing on a Saturday afternoon to watch a movie. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to talk about was we're still having some trouble with our parking. So if you know somebody coming out to the high school for any other events or anything like that, uh, please let them know or talk to them or spread the word however you can. There is library parking there, and we'd like to keep that reserved for library patrons so they have access to the building. Um, there's a lot of other parking around there that, uh, for sporting events and other events. Uh, please visit me on the side of the table there. I have flyers for all the goings on here, the times and dates. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. It sounds like fun. Okay. Um, next is Travis Griffin. He is with Emergency Management and the Jeffco Sheriff's Department um, talking about um, the Jeffco Slash program. And we're kind of in the beginning stages, but there's a little bit in the works for a permanent slash site. Hi, everybody. I'm Travis Griffin. I'm the Fire Management Officer for Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. And I'm here to give you guys an update on. The 2014 slash collection sites, um, we're going to be business as usual for 2014. There's three weekends, um, Elk Creek at Conifer High School, uh, they've moved from Father's Day weekend to July, so that's the big change for this year. Um, still do not have enough to have the seven sites like it used to be, so we're continuing with what we're budgeted for for the three weekends. So, um, along with last year, uh, those that live um, off of Sourdough, we had to route everybody through that community for the Inner Canyon weekend, and uh, we're going to be continuing to do that because of safety concerns along 285 and getting people off the, off the highway. So. Um, the fees are going to be the same, nominal fees, um, and this will be posted on the Jeffco Sheriff's Office Emergency Management webpage um, if you guys have questions about the dates. And it's also in your handout, sorry, uh, it's the third final page.
page, has all the dates and the directions and the collection fees. Um, and then I was also uh, requested to uh, give you guys a brief update on where we're at with uh, possibly locating a permanent um, slash collection facility or a sort yard, uh, so to speak, for maybe large, larger diameter logs, uh, mount pine beetle material, and, and the like. So um, basically what I can tell you that I know on my end is that I produced a grant request through the Homeland Security uh, Grant Program for the North Central Region, which Jefferson County is one of those counties in the 10 county North Central Region. And uh, the North Central Region approved the grant request for a piece of equipment, it's called an air curtain incinerator. And so we initially looked at Schaefer's Crossing and due to public comment, uh, I just want to assure people in the room that that is off the table. So uh, we're looking to other sites. There has been a working group that I've been somewhat involved in, but that working group has looked at the feasibility of keeping a permanent slash site budget neutral, and that didn't, didn't pan out, so they went to an RFP, which is out right now to the private sector and anybody else that basically has a silver bullet for this permanent slash collection problem in Jefferson County where we can give you residents a site to bring your hazardous fuel for wildland fire mitigation on your properties. So um, we're in initial stages finding a different site than the Schaefer um, and we're going through all the research and development and, and going to be looking uh, at this process um, very, very carefully and want to assure you that if it does come to fruition, we do have uh, a slash collection site with an air curtain incinerator similar to Boulder counties that uh, it will be 100% safe um, and that we will you know, do our due diligence to make sure that this, uh, this program benefits the community at large in terms of wildfire protection. So um, I'll be here uh, to try to help answer some of those questions, but we right now currently are just at that stage. We've been approved for that piece of equipment. I'll be writing more grants to get more equipment to help feed it, take care of that white ash that's left over, and uh, working potentially with Park County residents in the South Central region uh, to be able to utilize the, that's already been approved. The folks on the Park County side can certainly use our site once we get it up. So um, we have we have lots of lots of things ahead of us to, to make this happen. And uh, I only know a little bit right now. There's that, like I said, that whole other working group um, on the county side that's really spearheading it. So um, thank you for your time tonight. Since I got a one minute, I'm, I'm finished. So. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Um, we hope you come back and we will give everybody updates on what is happening with this. Um, okay, next we have Chucky Nemchek with the Conifer Recreation Coalition to give us a little bit of update about that. Chucky. I have to have my assistant here. Um, first, I want to I want to thank uh, Conifer Area Council for always giving us an opportunity to sort of update you and let you know where things are at um, with this project. Uh, it's basically about a year and a half project and we're not quite about halfway, but pretty close to halfway into it. Um, the project place is what we've called the master plan. And uh, this is just a quick update. And I will warn you, I'm not gonna give you a lot of information because we have another meeting that's coming up that gives you a lot more. This is just one of those enticing meetings here. So. Hey, it worked. <laughs> so, okay, Project Place. We started this fall um, as far as getting the word out to the community and finding out what it is that you wanted. 
um, what's missing, what you're looking for as far as recreational opportunities in Conover. Again, um, I have to stress, and I, I stress this very strongly, it is not a recreation district effort. Um, recreation is defined very broadly. It's everything from hiking to square dancing. Um, so just keep that in mind when, you, when we talk about recreation in this format. So the purpose of the, of the project place was to, again, see what, see what you wanted, see what was out here. See, uh, some people are saying they would like for people up the hill to, or down the hill to come up and see what we have up here. Others say that's not what they want. So our job is to just listen and find out what it is that people do want um, and what they like about what we have. One of the, the project place is actually a master plan. And that master plan can be used by anyone in, in, that does recreation in any form in our area. And it gives them some credence when they go to try to find funding or they try to uh, put together a, a business plan. With a master plan behind you, it does, give it, it does give you some power to get things done. Project Place covers um, basically everything from Mountain Morrison on up through uh, to Park County. We stop at the Park County edge. Um, what you see on the north is the Evergreen Rec District, and we're, we're staying away from all of that and just encompassing pretty well everything else. So what, what do you want? What do you need in terms of recreation here? Here's a little bit about what we heard. Here's what people said they loved. I don't think any of this would be a surprise, although I have to admit, even though I've lived here for quite some time, I learned a little bit about some places that I didn't even realize we, that we had. Um, what they love, and I hope you can read this. It's kind of small. Um, but walking around Evergreen Lake, I thought that was interesting. That came up a lot, and we were talking about conifer the whole time. So, uh, horseback riding in Staunton Park. We got a lot of comments about the amazing things that were going on at Staunton Park. Uh, picnics at Conifer Community Park at Beaver Ranch. Fly fishing on South Platte. Uh, Buffalo Creek, just in general. Um, Bear Creek Stables, music at my ranch. Meeting friends at Brooks Place. Uh, playgrounds at Beaver Ranch. More of what we loved. Excuse me, I'm sorry, what we would like to see this time. Swimming pool. Now I know we have a swimming pool in, in Bailey, but a swimming pool came, uh, came up on the list. The things of what we would like to see are not in any specific order. They're pretty random, and we did that on purpose. Um, we did see a, a theme coming through as far as people thought that we needed a meeting place. Um, we have a, a couple of meeting places, but some people felt as if they weren't adequate, um, that we needed uh, more opportunity to get into those places, or we needed larger places. We did see some people asking for volleyball courts or, uh, or fields, uh, outside fields to play. Uh, a community calendar. I know um, Sharon and her group does an excellent job of the community calendar and trying to keep everybody informed on what's going on, and as does Conifer Area Council. So, uh, but we're, what we're finding is that people haven't quite figured all that out yet. They're not sure where to go to access that. So that may be, I'm back. Okay. okay, anyway, that may be um, something that we take a serious look at, is how do we get everybody together and, uh, and try to coordinate all of them. What we would like, again, more playgrounds, more sledding hills. We have the best sledding hill around, so I was kind of surprised to see that one. Um, but as I said, this is really a teaser. We want you all to come to our meeting. It's right here. It's March 12th. And we hope that you come, that you see that more detail about what it is that people want, and then get some ideas on how do we, what do we do with this? You know, how do we form this master plan? Again, we're not done yet. We need lots of feedback, and we need a lot of your input. So to reach us, um, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're out there, we're everywhere. So I hope that um, that you will come and, and if I don't already have your email, if you're not on our email list, please come by and, and give me your name and phone number and email and we'll make sure that we keep you informed. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, living high has new meaning, as you know, and we have Ron Hyman, the State Registrar and Director of the Office of Vital Statistics and Medical Marijuana Registry, 
and Mike Van Dyke with Recreational Marijuana Unit here to talk to us about Living High has new meaning. <laughs> Thank you. We have just a slight technical thing to set up. Uh, as Shirley mentioned, my name is Ron Hyman. I'm the State Register of Biostatistics, Statistics, and I also have a minor other job directing the Medical Marijuana Registry for Colorado. Some of you may have heard about it. I can share with you that my mother, when she heard about it, had some interesting comments. What I'd like to do uh, to start off with is to give you just a brief history, not anything in depth. And it works. Great magic. Uh, so, the medical marijuana program in Colorado commenced with the vote of the people back in November of 2000. The registry itself kicked off in the summer of 2001. And for the first several years, it was a very small program. We had maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000 patients register each year. And then came 2009, when our friends at the federal government announced that they were not going to utilize federal resources to prosecute individuals who were in full compliance with the medical marijuana program in their state. The second impactor from the feds was in 2011, when our friends at the ATF said that anyone on a medical marijuana registry was prohibited from purchasing or owning a firearm. Now let me show you what the impact of that was. <laughs> Notice that we had a slight increase after the announcement that they were not going to prosecute. We went from 1,000 or so a year to 120,000 a year. I went from a staff of one person to a staff of 30 people working on this. That was just an incredibly challenging time frame. Notice that we had a nice drop off uh, beginning with the fall of 2011 when apparently a lot of patients decided that they needed to ensure that they were still able to get their uh, purchases of firearms accomplished. And uh, since uh, about uh, 2012, beginning of that period, we've slowly come back up now, and we've pretty much stabilized at about 110,000 patients a year. Now, in, uh, of course, November of 2012, Amendment 64, approving retail marijuana, was passed. And I can't tell you how many folks came to me and said, Ron, you're going to be out of a job. No one's going to do medical marijuana anymore. They'll just go down to the retail shop. And notice that we had no change. I will give you three reasons why we had no change. First is quantity of product. If you're on the medical marijuana registry, you can have more product in your possession than you can from the retail side. Second reason, minors, those less than 18 years of age, you have to be at least 21 years old in order to be participate in the retail side. Third, a minor little thing called taxes. You may have heard that the state put about 25% tax on it, and the county put their tax on top of that, and then the city put their tax on top of that. But if you're in the medical side, you don't worry about that. So from a financial perspective, I think that the medical marijuana industry is, is not going anywhere. In order to be approved for medical marijuana, you have to have at least one of eight standard conditions. Now, you can have more than one condition, but you have to have at least one of these as uh, approved by your uh, physician. Note that the most uh, popular or the most reported condition that we have is severe pain. And that's about 94% of our, our uh, patients report that. Uh, I do want to call your attention to the fact that we do have a number of people who have severe medical conditions. Uh, stage 4 cancer, for example. I've known several folks who had stage 4 cancer, and they reported to me that medical marijuana is what made the difference in their quality of life, and I believe them. Uh, cachexia, for those who don't know, that's wasting syndrome. Um, individual, particularly if you're on some sort of very strong chemotherapy, for example, you tend to lose weight and you don't have an appetite 
and medical marijuana, of course, assist with that. Uh, just a few demographic characteristics. Uh, the average age of our patients is 41. I know a lot of people think that it would be 27, but it's actually 41. Uh, it's about uh, a third female. Uh, to give you an idea in terms of the age range of our patients, our oldest patient is 98, and our youngest patient is 17 months. Some of you may have seen on uh, CNN a few months ago, there was a report from a family down in Colorado Springs. They have a child, uh, Charlotte, who, has, who was born with a very debilitating condition. She suffered from hundreds of seizures every day. And with medical marijuana, she is now down to a handful of seizures a day. It's an incredible godsend for this family. And uh, if you ever had a chance to see that report, it's just uh, astounding, the difference in the quality of life. Now, we've seen since that report a substantial increase in the number of minor patients that are coming, uh, being reported to us. Plus, we're having reports of individuals moving to our state, not just from other states, but from other countries. I've had families from Australia, I've had families from Nigeria, moved to Colorado, specifically to obtain, it's called Charlotte's Web, is the particular, particular strain that they use. And, and so it's, it's just godsend for those families. Uh, just to let you know, we currently turn around an application in about 22 calendar days, which is not too bad, given the quantity that we face. Uh, we work with the patients, we work with their physicians, we work with our primary caregivers. What is that? That's an individual who has significant responsibility for the care of the patient. Think spouse, think parent, think adult child. And we have about 5,000 patients who have a primary caregiver. Uh, the majority of our patients now use marijuana care centers. They're what we used to call dispensaries. They are operated on a more business industrial scale as opposed to the caregiver, which is an individual scale. We also work with the Marijuana Enforcement Division of the Department of Revenue, which has responsibility for licensing and uh, supervising the medical marijuana centers. And of course, we also work with law enforcement. Now, the Amendment 20 specified that we can only work with state and local law enforcement not with our friends at the federal government, which is fun when you're sitting across the table from the DEA chief. <laughs> when I say product, what am I talking about? Uh, the standard amount that medical marijuana patients are received is uh, six plants and two ounces. Please don't ask me what a plant is. <laughs> now, the law does provide an opportunity if the physician feels it's appropriate to recommend additional quantities of product based on that individual's medical condition. Now, a lot of people, when they think of marijuana, of course, they think of smoking. But many of our patients, because of their medical condition, they cannot smoke medical marijuana. So they utilize other formats, such as edibles. Obvious example, brownies, but it's not limited to just brownies. You can go to the, to the medical care centers, and it's amazing, the variety of uh, edibles that you can get. I've seen lollipops, I've seen cookies, I saw pizza. Uh, we used to have a, uh, at least two full-scale marijuana restaurants in Denver. Those have since uh, closed down. But there are tinctures. Tincture is basically where you take the, the plant and you compress it and you extract the oil from the plant. So it's like an oil. Uh, a lot of people use soaps or shampoos that actually absorb it through the skin that way. Uh, just a brief history of how you would go about applying. You would download our application form from our website. You have your physician fill out a physician certification. You send in that with proof of uh, residence in Colorado. You have to be a resident. You don't have to be a full-time resident. So if you have a vacation home in Colorado, if you're a student at one of our fine universities from out of state, then you would qualify. You also send proof of ID. Uh, our annual fee now, uh, just recently, was lowered to $15 per year. You have to reapply every year. For minors, there is additional hoops that they have to jump through. For example, they have to be uh, evaluated by two separate physicians. Uh, 
the seals. They had some issues that we face. Uh, of course, our friends with the federal government, we uh, are under their scrutiny. And I think that not just the feds, but a lot of other states are watching us to make sure that we operate a program that is prudent, that is defensible, that is honest. And that we can say with a straight face that we are doing adequate steps to make sure that the program is not being abused. Uh, employers. Amendment 20 specified that the employers do not have to make uh, accommodations for individuals using medical marijuana. Now you want to stay tuned on that because there is a court case now before the Colorado Supreme Court where an individual who was terminated for using medical marijuana not on the job no indication of impairment on the job, but just because they tested positive for the testing that that employer utilized. The Supreme Court has taken up that case, so it may be interesting to see how that may change. Uh, landlords. We get quite a few calls from uh, landlords, and particularly uh, multi-unit residences, where people say the aroma of the marijuana is wafting over from my next door neighbor's house into my house. Uh, that is strictly between the landlord and the tenant. There's no legal protection there for that. Uh, schools, I mentioned that the number of minors is increasing substantially. At some point, some of these kids are going to be going to school. And are schools prepared for having the school nurse administer medical marijuana? Or in some ways being able to accommodate these, these young folks? So that's, again, an interesting challenge. We have a variety of city county ordinances across the state where different counties have decided that they do not wish to have a marijuana care center in their locality, or they may only limit it to retail care centers, or they may limit it to medical care centers, no retail, or some combination thereof. It's kind of a, a mishmash across the state. Public consumption. Uh, medical marijuana is not to be consumed anywhere that it can be uh, considered public, for example, on the street. However, if you happen to be in Civic Center Park in downtown Denver on April the 20th, you want to be careful about your inhale. Uh, but again, it is not protected by law. So an individual who uses it in public uh, could be subject to sanctions. Uh, driving under the influence is a big concern that folks have. Uh, last year, uh, the legislature put forth a requirement of, I believe it's five nanometers, I think that's the correct terminology. Uh, Mike can probably speak more to that. Three? Three nan. Four. <laughs> Nanograms, <laughs> correct. Uh, the difficulty with that is A, you had to choose my understanding is that you have to blood, draw a blood sample in order to do that sort of testing. And most officers on the street aren't qualified for that. So there are other mechanisms that they use to try and determine if someone is impaired, and then they can call specialized units that can do the drug testing. And uh, grow operations are a concern because when you have a large quantity, particularly if you're using some sort of some of these chemicals, there could be dangers. And I'm out of time, so I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague. Medical marijuana always gets all in play. They've taken my time, but that's all right. My name is Mike Van Dyke. I um, uh, have a really long title at the health department there. Also known as a legal marijuana guy. Mother's really proud about that as well. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, you know, on, when this was all legalized, this is, this is a big deal for public health. This is a huge paradigm shift. We're used to marijuana being an illegal drug and treating it as an illegal drug. Uh, but now we have to treat it the same as alcohol and tobacco. So this is a whole different way of thinking about marijuana for us in public health. So, and this was about our reaction the first year after we passed this stuff. And thinking about all the potential issues that we might have around marijuana. 
And even in the bill to legalize marijuana, we were called out to do specific things like monitor the health effects of the population and changes in health effects as this stuff becomes legal. Also to think about education and prevention, and then to do some other things like food safety, laboratory practices, and waste management around uh, legal marijuana. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about there's a lot of people out there that use marijuana. And these are some numbers that just show Colorado numbers, about 40% of people in high school have tried marijuana. About 22% have used it in the last 30 days. So that's Colorado numbers. That's a lot of kids that use marijuana. If we think about adults, we break it down a little bit differently. We know that about 41% of adults aged 18 to 25 have used marijuana in the last year. About 11.5% have used it in the last 30 days. So a huge number of adults use marijuana as well. It tends to go down a little bit as you get a little bit older. So I just want to say in terms of public health, there's an impact to legalizing marijuana. Um, and the question that I get mostly, is marijuana safe? And the public health response to that is really that regular marijuana use, there's pretty clear evidence that it increases the risk of heart, lung, and mental health problems. Um, that's, that's the standard answer. A lot less is known about infrequent and casual use of marijuana. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult thing because this is a natural product. Thousands of chemicals in this product, especially when you smoke it. So the science isn't necessarily going to come out tomorrow that says what happens to people when they use marijuana. This is hard stuff to deal with as a scientist. Everybody knows the short-term effects. This is what happens when you get high. I'm going to have to scan through some of this stuff, but just know that all of this stuff is available on our website, and we'll be glad to direct you to that. There's a myth out there that marijuana is not addictive. Marijuana is addictive. About 9% of those people who try marijuana as an adult first will become addicted. It's a lot less than tobacco, but it is still addictive. Uh, if you start using it earlier, the number goes up to about 17% of people. There's a lot known about the long-term health consequences of marijuana, including all of these things listed, including cardiovascular effects, um, possibly lung cancer, a lot of us with other respiratory effects, as well as a lot of mental health issues. Uh, the one thing I want to get across today, if there's no other public health message, it sticks. It is not safe to use marijuana during pregnancy or breastfeeding. Okay? Now, Pregnancy makes you nausea, makes you nauseous, but marijuana works for nausea, so there is some people who actually use marijuana in pregnancy. I want to tell people this is not safe. It also affects your ability to drive, and secondhand smoke from marijuana is pretty much the same as secondhand smoke from tobacco. So no differences there. Now there's a lot of other stuff that I could talk about, but I'm getting pulled out. I want to make sure that I say that, you know, we've talked a lot about using edibles. Using edibles is probably the safest method of marijuana use. But even when you use edibles, you are ingesting THC, and THC is the active ingredient of marijuana, and that's what causes a lot of these health effects. So there is a risk of health effects even from using edibles. Okay. So there's a lot of resources out there at the health department now. This is our new website. Um, if you come up and talk to me afterwards, I could direct you to that website as well. Sorry I didn't have enough time to go into much more detail. But uh, there's my contact information if you guys need more information. Thank you. I hate that we can't always let everybody speak as long as they want to. Um, so, sorry, but hopefully people will come up and please go up and ask any questions that you might have and go to the website. Um, now we have um, Captain Del Kleinschmidt of the Jeffco Sheriff Department um, just going to talk a little bit about what's happening in our community that we really need to know. You know, I'm not sure if there's something to go with here. We're talking about using a slash incinerator and marijuana in the same night. I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe some of you want that down in Schaefer's Crossing. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but seriously, folks, thanks for having us here tonight. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you all. Obviously, a lot of uh, press has been out recently. We had a line of duty, a line of duty death recently. Sergeant Dave Baldwin was killed tragically by somebody who was driving on the wrong side of the road, intentionally passing in a no passenger zone. The support from the community on that was absolutely outstanding. And I can't thank you enough from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for doing that. Uh, as far as criminal activity in your mountain precincts, the Mountain Precinct is pretty lucky. We've got a great neighborhood. We've got great partners. People call all the time, let us know what's going on. Same as everywhere else in our county, crime of opportunity. Just uh, yesterday we had somebody thought it was okay to leave a shotgun in a case in plain view on the back seat. Somebody else is running around with that shotgun right now. So please, guys, lock it up. Um, other than that, we've had some mail thefts going on, so if you see something suspicious, Pick up the phone calls. Um, you may have heard recently of that fatal family shooting that occurred up in Indian Hills. There was no threat to the public on that one. And I'll touch on that here in a little bit about how we notify the public on crimes that are occurring. Um, being prepared. We've talked about fires in the past. Chief McLaughlin's here from Elk Creek. They'll be talking, I believe it's going to be in April. Um, you're going to have to your local fire department talking about issues there. But really, it is about being prepared. Get ready for the season. How many people thought we would have a big flood in Jefferson County? Those of you who have been here before know we've had floods before after fires. So they kind of go hand in hand. Buffalo Creek, the prime example on that one. Uh, with that, Evergreen Fire, uh, Evergreen fire Department is hosting a wildland fire forum on February 26th. It's at 7 o'clock at Evergreen High School. That's open to the public. If you guys can make that one, we're all a team. Every fire department up here is a team. So if you guys want to make that one, if you got questions, concern, it's the same type of stuff. Uh, if you go to our website, jeffco.us, that has all kinds of information. It has uh, reminders about the slash pickups that we'll be doing, um, the evacuation information, Smart 911, Code red. If you hear that there's an incident occurring somewhere else in the county and you want to know what that code red notification was, it'll be on our website as well. Um, on that jeffco.us, when you go to the sheriff's link to that, um, you can go in and you can do online crime reporting. You can get information about concealed weapon permit applications, ID theft, um, all kinds of news and events going on. Um, what I mentioned earlier about our fatal family shooting that occurred in Indian Hills. Our PIOs, our, our uh, press information that goes out, that goal for their unit is to put out anything that's important to the community within two minutes. If you're on Facebook, Twitter, the blog spot, once things get rolling, you'll have up-to-date information. So anytime you have a major incident occurring, you can call 911 if you're in the middle of the emergency and you need help. If you call the information number, you'll be on hold for a while. Um, but if you go to all of our website stuff, especially the Twitter, you're going to see what's going on in the, on that situation right away. Today was a prime example. We had another gas line cut down south. Within two minutes it was out, so people knew the area to avoid. So with that said, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting us. You guys have a great night. And as, as you know, we have the sheriff here every time, so if you ever, you know, would like to talk to them about anything, they're here. Um, and last, we have a state legislature update. Um, Senator Jeannie Nicholson is here. Um, is Sherry Giroux out in the audience? I don't think we've seen her. Okay. So, Jeannie, if you could give us a legislative update. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me this evening, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I am your State Senator Jeannie Nicholson. I live in the foothills just like you do at 9,000 feet in Golden Gate Canyon and uh, so I share many of the concerns that you have about wildfires and other mountain living issues. Um, if you want to learn more about me you can go to my website it's SenatorGeannieNicholson.com on the website is an easy way for you to communicate back to me concerns that you have or questions that you have, requests um, that you have maybe about a personal issue 
uh, that you'd like me to um, help you with, or um, any legislation that you'd like to weigh in on, or legislation you'd like to recommend. I also have business cards here um, at the table um, over to my right, um, and so you can pick up one of those and have all the information about how to get a hold of me. It has my home phone number, my uh, personal address, as well as all the contact information at the Capitol. And of course, um, immediately after um, I speak, and I'd be happy to speak with any of you personally about any um, issues you have or questions you might have. I want to talk to you just very quickly about some legislation that the legislature thinks is a high priority this year. We think that college affordability is a major issue for uh, families in Colorado. And so we will be carrying a bill in the Senate and the House that will try to lower um, this curve and kind of flatten it out um, that we see right now with the high cost of college tuition. We know that um, not only is tuition going up, uh, the portion of tuition that the students are paying is much higher than it used to be. There are fewer grants available for students. It's making it uh, difficult for um, students from middle class families to attend college and certainly um, for, for students from limited income families. And um, when they do, uh, when they are able to uh, complete their college education, they're often settled with enormous loans uh, to pay back um, that make it very difficult for them to um, gain their own economic security. So we'll be working hard on that because we think that's an important issue. Another issue that I am directly working on with some legislation that I'm a prime sponsor on is also connected kind of at the other end of the childhood age uh, level is uh, a bill to make child care more affordable. Uh, Colorado ranks in um, ranks third in the country for the most expensive child care. And as many of you may know, uh, it can be as much as twelve to twenty thousand dollars a year for child care. And uh, for many families, especially on limited incomes, it's unaffordable um, without some sort of assistance. And we want those moms and dads to be working. Uh, so we want their children to be in safe, high quality, uh, affordable child care centers and um, we want those moms and dads to continue to work and um, improve their skills, their workforce abilities and become more and more self-sufficient and so child care becomes a very important part of that plan for us to help families become more self-sufficient and to make all of us have more economic security. And finally, I want to talk about a bill that I'm carrying regarding firefighter safety. I chair the Firefighter Matters Interim Committee, kind of a mouthful, this summer prior to the legislative session because of my own um, concern about wildfires and how seriously they affect um, all the citizens in my community. And one of the things that we learned during the testimony that we heard this summer was that firefighters are disproportionately more at risk for uh, several kinds of cancers, including 100% higher risk of testicular cancer, uh, which, as many of you know, affects very young men. And it seems to me, and it seemed to me when I heard this, that if we ask firefighters to put themselves in harm's way as we're leaving harm's way, we ought to be responsible for trying to keep them as safe as possible. Not just the obvious immediate risks that they put themselves um, under, which is um, serious enough, but the long-term impacts for them. So this particular bill allows money um, to provide grants to local fire departments so that they can purchase the equipment that they need to be safer 
um, not only in the fire and the exposure um, that's obvious to all of us, but long-term protections that they need to protect them from these various kinds of cancers. And uh, with that, I will just um, thank you again uh, for being here this evening, and please feel free to talk to me afterwards. Thank you, Jeannie. So I hope you all stay around um, to talk to all the speakers. Um, they're all around the room, so please come and talk to them all. Um, our next town hall meeting is Wednesday, April 16th, so we hope to see you all there. And I'd like to thank, again, um, Look What I Found and Luna's Mandela for their community support of this meeting. Please go back and see what they have at their table and go by their shops. Um, again, thank you so much for being here tonight. We'll see you next time. <laughs>